Hey, welcome students. In this video, I want to go ahead and talk to you about double replacement reactions. Uh, as we've done in the previous lessons, we're going to go ahead and show you the general uh, format that uh, this happens using a generic equation, and then we're going to give you some examples so that you can practice with us. Okay, so generally when we talk about double replacement reactions, typically what happens here is we've got a compound AB, and it's being combined with compound CD, and this is going to give us some kind of product. The first thing we want to do is identify that the A in this particular generic equation is going to be the positive side of things. And so we got to go ahead and label that as a positive. We also know that the first atom in CD is also going to be positive. And by default, that means that the B and the D are both the negative. So what we expect to happen here is we expect this A to come in and react with the D. And we also expect the C to come in and to react with the B, forming the products we see on the other end of the equation, which is the following. We expect to see AD as well as C and B. And so those are the products that we ex expect to observe once A, B, and C, D are combined. So let me provide you with two examples of how this actually happens. So this first example I'm going to show you involves uh, potassium iodide, that's Ki, and we're going to go ahead and react this with lead nitrate, which is PbNO3. And this is going to form the product. Now, we can take this moment here to kind of engage in a step that we haven't done so far and kind of predict. If we look at the, the general equation at the very top, we can almost predict what's going to happen here because we know that the potassium is the positive side. We know that the lead is the positive side. So we know that the potassium here is going to want to combine with the nitrate. And so what we do is we kind of just predict that equation. And so we'll go ahead and put that forward. And so what we'll get here is we'll go ahead and start with by getting PBI plus KNO3. Now, we're not entirely done because what we got to do here is, since we've got this, we got to pay very close attention to the actual charges. Potassium has a plus one charge, and lead in this particular case is going to have a two charge. Okay, that means that the iodine is going to have a minus one charge, and the nitrate here is going to have a minus one charge. But since we've got two of them, the total charge there is going to be minus two. And so when we look at the right hand side of the equation, when we've got lead, we got to remember that lead here has a plus two charge. So that means that we're going to need at least two iodines here to balance it out. Now the nitrate and the potassium, they're each uh, plus one for the potassium, minus one for the nitrate, so those are good to go, those are neutral there. But in order for us to get a neutral compound with lead and iodine on the right hand side, we needed to have a second iodine. Now that we've got this, we're ready to go. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do, just so that we don't get ourselves confused, is we're going to go ahead and rewrite this equation uh, without these little charges at the very top. Okay, so actually what I'm going to do is just going to go ahead and scratch these out because they're going to confuse us and so I don't want those numbers to kind of be in the, in the way for us. We'll just scratch them out for now and then we'll go forward. So we'll go ahead do our traditional thing here. We'll go ahead and divide the plane. Here's left and here's right. And so let's go ahead and, and balance these out. And so we'll start with the leftmost atom. That's going to be the potassium here. And so we've got one potassium on the left. We've got one potassium on the right, if you look at the KNO3 at the far right there. And so we've got one on each side of, of the equation, on the left and the right, so those are good. So we'll go on to the next atom, which is the iodine. And in the iodine here, we've got one. And so we, when we look at the right-hand side of the equation, we've got two iodines. So the simple solution here is to add another compound of Ki. Now we've got two iodines on the left, two iodines on the right, but in doing so, we increase our potassium count to two on the left. And so if we look at the right-hand side, we've only got one when we look at KNO3, so we're going to have to add another, KNO3. So now we've got two potassiums on the left, two potassiums on the right, two iodines on the left, two iodines on the right, and we go over to the lead, which is the PB, and we notice that we've got one on the left, one on the right. All that's left to do is to look at the nitrates here, and we've got two of them. So you've noticed a little two down here. That means we've got two of them. So when we look at the right-hand side, we've got one and two we are all set. All that is left for us to do now is to count the actual amounts of uh, compounds that we've got or groups in each section and then we can write the coefficients. So here's one, here's two, 
that means our coefficient here is going to be 2. And when we look at the lead nitrate, we've got only 1, so our coefficient is 1. Looking at the lead iodate, iodide, that's going to be 1, so our coefficient is 1. And looking at the potassium nitrate at the very end, we've got 1 and 2, giving us a coefficient of 2. And so if this was a uh, multiple choice problem, what we, you would be looking for, you would be looking for a answer that has the following uh, coefficient sequence, 2, 1, 1, and 2. Just a brief reminder, this 2 here represents is represented there, the 1 is represented there, as well as 1 on the right-hand side, and the last 2 is the far 2 uh, on the far end for KNO3. So that is the first example. I know that I might have gone a little uh, quick on that one, but you can always go back, rewind it, watch it again as many times as you need to so that you can get these types of problems correct. Let me show you the second equation that I've got for you. And so let's go ahead and pause this and I'm going to go ahead and erase the board and we'll have we'll begin with a new uh, screen. Okay, so just go ahead and got that erased. So let's go ahead and look at the second equation that we've got. This equation involves the following. And so this equation is going to involve us taking iron and sulfur, which is iron sulfide, and we're going to react this with hydrochloric acid and it should give us the following result. H2S, which is actually a gas, but I'm not going to denote the, the indication here. And we're also going to get iron chloride, which is FeCl2. Now, this is the basic equation. This is going to be a double replacement, so let's just go identify the parts for us. We know that the iron is positive, the sulfur is minus, the positive is on the hydrogen, and chlorine is going to have a minus one charge. If we look at the sulfur, the sulfur is going to have a minus 2 charge. So the iron in this particular case is going to have a plus 2 charge, just to keep it straight. So what will happen here is that the iron will come in and it will want to combine with the chlorine in hydrochloric acid and the hydrogen will then bind with the sulfur, forming the compounds on the right. And so let's go ahead and begin. We'll go our, do our division. Here's our left side, our right side. Beginning on the left side, the first atom that we see is the iron, and so that one's there. We've got one iron on the left. If we go to the right side, we notice we've got one iron on the right. Our irons are balanced, one apiece on either side. Then we move on to the sulfurs. We've got one sulfur on the left and one sulfur on the right, so we're good to go so far. When we look at the hydrogens on the left in HCl, we've only got one. However, on the right-hand side in H2S, we've got two hydrogens. So right off the bat, I'm going to have to add another hydrogen chloride, or hydrochloric acid. So now I've got two hydrogens, but what I've done is I've increased my chlorine count to two, but that's not a problem because on the right-hand side, I've already got two chlorines. So no need to worry there. So I go back and I just double-check everything. My iron, Fe, one on the left, one on the right, one sulfur on the left, one sulfur on the right, two hydrogens on the left, two on the right, two chlorines on the left, and two chlorines on the right. We're, we're good here. This equation is balanced, so all that's left to do is to count the numbers or the, the amounts that we've got, and we've got one here, so our coefficient will be one. In the HCl, we've got one and two. Our coefficient here will be two. In the H2S, we've only got one, so that coefficient there will be one. And in the iron chloride, we've only got one as well, and our coefficient there will be one. So if we're looking for an answer in a multiple choice, the answer that we want is going to be the following coefficient sequence. 1, 2, 1, 1. Okay, so those are the two examples that we've got for you for double replacement reactions. Go ahead and watch the next video and hopefully you'll get a lot more practice on identifying all these types of chemical reactions.